Hey there, all you creepers and reapers. Welcome back to another episode of the Femme Fatalities. I'm your co-hostess, Anna, and I'm here with my co-hostess, Margaret. Hello, all you grieflings and frightening, frightlings, and welcome to another fabulously spooky episode. What are we talking about today, Anna? Well, I'm going to say a word. Okay. Billy. So what comes to mind? No, not a Billy goat. And no, not Billy the puppet. Although he's going to be spoken about quite a bit, too. I'm talking yeah. about Billy from Scream. Ooh, good old Billy Loomis. So our listeners, if you haven't watched any of the Screams yet, and we're focusing on the first Scream, the original, the OG Scream, pause. Go watch it. There is trigger warnings. It can be pretty graphic. Sexual content. What else is there? Anna, um, anything else? In terms of it being graphic, there's a lot of knife horror um, mm -hmm. and a lot of body horror in general. Um, also, like you said, sexual situations. Um, to anyone who is not a fan of the costume or the mask you definitely don't want to be watching the film either um and i think that there are <clears throat> questions of adult and parental responsibility throughout the film as well so i think it's teenage angst on an acid trip uh is is how i would kind of describe what you're watching when you look at it from more of a thanatological perspective than just a horror entertainment. Um, although the the movie, I, I rewatched it a few weeks ago, and it is like all of its glory from what the late '90s, early 2000s. Definitely, you can spot the fashion and the vernacular and all of those sorts of things from that particular era. Um, but but it's great for what it is, and uh, definitely uh it's worth a watch if you're gonna watch any of the screen franchise you, you gotta watch the first couple to kind of know what's going on and speaking of which that's why we actually chose billy because we've been talking a lot about filial loss and filial grief mm -hmm. and his character lost his mom but not in the death sense um so he has lost a pivotal parental figure from his life due to some issues that we're going to get into later. Um, and <clears throat> how he deals with that is not what any of us would describe as healthy, nor would we recommend it by any means. However, the spiral that it sets him into is very reflective of someone who may be an adolescent or going through some things at a younger age that does not have support from the other parent um, as well as maybe the support they need from friends other family members from the school system from maybe a coach or another mentor or someone uh, from an organization they belong to in their life as well Yes. Ooh, well said about the lack of support as we're talking about this t sort of different kind of family grief that often becomes grief associated with secrets based on our family relationships. And then we don't get those supports because the family now has this secret. Billy's mom has left due to extramarital affair and this anger that he's carrying towards the people involved who he feel has taken his mom away from him and how in our families we oh it stays behind closed doors we don't discuss mm -hmm. this we don't air our dirty laundry and so billy isn't able to get those supports he can't talk to his girlfriend i'm wondering if Stu doesn't know since Stu <laughs> is his main accomplice in this mm -hmm. and Stu is already got his own parent issues they're rich they're not around a lot mm -hmm. they're not supporting Stu, and so Stu now feeds billy's anger i'm guessing since we don't have this backstory 
and yeah. not, hey, dude, I get you're really angry. You're really upset. That really sucks what happened in your family. Like, yeah, parents suck. They let us down. They've hurt us. And then what happens when we are unable to get supports to process that deep, profound pain when our mother leaves us, when our parents leave us because they'd rather travel and think is do mm -hmm. towards the end my parents yeah. are gonna kill me he's so yeah. afraid even though he just murdered all these people he's more yeah. afraid of being in trouble with his parents for mm -hmm. ruining for him bleeding all over the house yeah and it's it's interesting because i think depending on your relationship like Stu's fear of parental disapproval is something that really caught my attention in the movie because still to this day as as a, a grown woman I say one of the worst things I can do is disappoint my parents. I still want them to be proud of me. Um, and it's not like I'm 12 anymore. But um, yeah, of course you. And one thing I noticed too, I think that everyone in the first scream, like all the kids are suffering from affluenza, which basically means sickeningly affluent. Because if you look in the beginning, like the house that Drew Barrymore's character lives in, it's her parents and her. And there's this ginormous house. And all of these kids live in huge, huge homes. And I'm like, man, there's a bunch of rich kids in this movie. Um, <laughs> I don't know about you, but most of my friends when I was in high school did not live in ginormous McMansions. So, um, yeah, we were, we were yes. all uh, pretty much like working class, middle class families. And uh, yeah, so not, you know, when I saw it when I was younger, I was just like, oh, whatever, this is a slasher movie. But looking at it now, I'm like, man, these rich kids in this movie walking around like they don't have a care in the world until Ghostface comes for them. Um, <laughs> yes, agreed. And that how that has impacted their reality, their ability mm -hmm. to cope, their ability to relate to each other. I was caught by that too. Like when the town goes on lockdown and all the kids are going to a party, yeah. Like, where are the parents? Like, <laughs> exactly. who's going to let these kids go to a party? And they're like, oh, yeah, nothing matters. And how that impacts our relationship with mm -hmm. life as well from a theological point of view, right? Life, death, mm -hmm. grief. It feels like they had yeah. no cares in the world. They didn't even care. Ghostface is killing their friends. Oh, that's fine. Let's just, yeah, let's go party. Let's give Ghostface the perfect place to just take us all out. Right. Yeah. And um, I think just <clears throat> for me too, I think it speaks a lot to the female dynamic, even though, you know, Billy is the killer and Stu is his accomplice um, because you take the idea that, a mother is so special in the eyes of a son, particularly. Yes. Um, and then <clears throat> a woman is valuable if she is a mother or if she's a virgin. Mm -hmm. Right. But once he has sex with Sydney, then it's time to kill her. Right. You're no yes. longer pure. You're, you're no longer valuable. You're no longer on this pedestal. Now it's time to dispose and discard of you. Yes. And that, like, right there, as you're talking about, like, the female role and how actually here it broke the trope of the virgin is mm -hmm. the final girl. Cindy's not a virgin. I'm guessing Gail Weathers, the other final girl, yeah. is not a virgin. And how mm -hmm. here, again, Billy gets his way. He's going to take Sydney's virginity. Mm -hmm. Because he's so upset about what happened with his mom. His mom was taken. In a sense, probably her virginity was taken. He's grieving what was taken from him. So he's going to mm -hmm. take that from Sydney. Oh, definitely. Yeah. And I think, you know, I, I'm so, so the plot itself, when I first saw it, I was like, oh, it's a slasher movie. But really now, like I'm evaluating it and I'm like, okay, so. Sydney's mom hooked up with your dad. Your mom found out and left. Um, you you choose to sexually assault and murder Sydney's mom, and then your Sydney's boyfriend, and then you're gonna kill her 
two, I I just like for me I'm like oh, okay because why is it Cindy's fault that all these adults were hooking up with each other and also we don't know like you said the background I mean that could have been the affair that broke the camel's back for Billy's mother I mean this could have been an ongoing problem for a very long time in the relationship and especially it sounds like. Sydney's dad was away on business a lot. Her mother did have a lot of gentleman callers because we hear about uh, what's his name, Cotton Weary, throughout the movie, mm-hmm. too. Yes. And I feel like you really touch on a really valid point that usually the woman, the woman is to blame. Mm-hmm. Sydney's mom gets blamed. Sydney gets blamed the men are not taking any accountability for having the affair for being with a married woman for their own anger Mm -hmm. so the woman is often the the means that men in this movie Mm -hmm. are taking out their anger yeah and i think too you know for Billy, it's kind of like, well, of course his behavior is extreme, and, and this is a horror movie, but it's like, his father, the impression I get from the little he's in the film is he's a very, like, throw money at it, make it go away type of person. I'm just like, why couldn't you have thrown money at, like, a therapist or a counselor mm-hmm. for your son when your wife left? Maybe we could have avoided all of these things. Um you know, in in retrospect. Oh, yes, that nobody is handling any of their life losses in this movie. The grief loss, yes, Sydney, she's kind of in her little bubble because her mom was killed by her lover and there's all this sadness, so that's acceptable grief. But nobody Mm -hmm. is addressing the life loss grief Sydney's dad always traveling, Billy really having no parental units, Stu having no parental units, and what happens when you are left to just figure out how are you going to cope, yeah. how are you going to deal with nobody there to talk to. Exactly. Yeah, and I think a lot of it, too, is even <clears throat> the adolescent conversations that we hear, um, or young adult, because they are you know, finishing up high school. Um, In relation to grief and death, one thing that really hit me when I was watching that was there's a scene where Billy is talking to Sydney and basically says, you need to get over the fact that your mom died less than a year ago. Mm -hmm. Not only did she die, she was brutally assaulted and murdered. Mm -hmm. So I'm like... He is not, like, he's not a sensitive, caring person. Just, you know, whether or not he's the killer, let's, let's, that's a moot point right now. But just to be so uncaring and insensitive to say that to another person, it's, it's just astounding to me. And, and really, when you think about it, how many times have we been in a situation where we're going through change or loss or we're grieving And someone we thought we knew and trusted made us feel like we didn't matter. Mm -hmm. You know, and anyone out there who's listening right now, if you've gotten to this point and you are going through a change or a grief or loss experience, you do matter. There are people Mm -hmm. out there who care about you and care to talk to you and letting you express your emotions and your feelings And anything that you feel is going on with your internal dialogue in a very healthy and compassionate way, just because maybe someone you thought you could rely on or would be there through this journey with you is not, does not indicate there is no one else out there. So always remember that there are supports and systems available to you and for you locally, regionally, virtually. There are so many ways to be supported and get help and talk about what is going on. And it's very important that you know that. Yes, yes. I cannot echo that enough. And Anna also brings up another really great point about grief and Sydney's grief. Sydney is experiencing traumatic grief. And so traumatic grief for any listeners out there. 
you cannot compare this grief to somebody who has what would be considered like a normal death. Their grandparent died at 90 years old. And that might not even be normal, depending on your relationship with them, family trauma, all these other things. There's all these things that impact our grief. Our grief is significantly impacted when the death is sudden and it is traumatic because now we are also struggling with understanding the whys. And we also will have a lot of guilt. We will have guilt that, well, maybe if I had, when my mom asked me to go to dinner, if I had gone to dinner with her, she wouldn't have been murdered. Oh, I, I'm alive. I should be dead. Or why am I being punished? So all these other factors come in when we lose somebody violently and tragically, because we're really trying to understand why. And our whole worldview is flipped upside down. So if you're going through traumatic grief, again, like Anna has said, get help. This is really hard. We really struggle. And it's also hard to talk with others when we have lost somebody traumatically. And so if somebody's going to talk to you because they've lost somebody to murder, to violence, to an accident, listen, be compassionate, don't ask questions. When my dad died in a motorcycle accident, I know how many people were like, how'd your dad die? What happened exactly? So Anna and I will be sharing with everybody our death of kids. Here's one. Do not ask for details about what happened. It's not going to help Sydney. Someone's like, your mom was raped and murdered. Well, what happened exactly? Where was she stabbed? No. Yeah. So that was my little soapbox, Anna. <laughs> I no, I totally agree with you. And honestly, um, <clears throat> and, you know, we are going, like Margaret said, we are going to be doing a couple of episodes of uh, a, a term we've dubbed death etiquette. Uh, so etiquette related to death and loss in different types of situations. Um, if there is someone who is experiencing traumatic grief and you are reacting viscerally to the situation or there is something in relation to the situation that you are unable to handle being a person near this person going through the traumatic grief experience you can very politely separate yourself from them for a period of time and be honest with them say i am very sorry i do not know what to do for you i do not help you please know i care about you I just do not know how to help you through this. And that is okay. Like, it's better to communicate that than try to go through and navigate the situation with this person and say or do something you both may regret or react to. Um, so that is okay. It's, it's okay to know your limits and to express what those limits are. It's when oftentimes we project our own internal dialogues and our own reactions, curiosities, even our own disgust onto someone else who's already dealing with traumatic grief, um, that, that we see a lot of really negative results in terms of interpersonal relationships, how people view themselves, what their self-worth is, what their self-esteem looks like, and many, many other things. Yes, grief has a profound impact on us. And if you're going through traumatic grief or know somebody who is, it's not uncommon for them to be actually having nightmares or intrusive thoughts related to what happened as they are trying to make sense. And so being there just to validate, to normalize traumatic grief is really hard. And we see that in Sydney, we see how that impacts her relationship with Billy. She doesn't want to be touched. Her mom was violently raped. She doesn't want to be intimate with him. You kind of see her do like this push pull with him. And that fuels his anger because he wants love. He wants nurturing. He wants that female companionship. He's lost his mom. And he also does that push pull because women are not safe to him. And for mm -hmm. Sydney, men are not safe to her because of both of their losses that they are both trying to understand. 
totally. It's really <laughs> um, w- with without the murder stuff. Um, it's it's really not a great relationship for either of them to be in because of their grief related and loss related issues. Um, but I think <laughs> part of it that makes it so difficult too is when you're a teenager. You know, it's it's all about your partner and, and that's that's life. It's about your friends and you know, your the person that you're partnered up with or, you know, whoever you're hooked up with. And it's very difficult to see the world beyond that, even if something traumatic does happen. Um, so it's kind of this expectation that I need to fall back into these kind of normal roles that are appealing to my group or my subgroup that I belong to, whether it be at school or, you know, if you're involved in sporting or some sort of hobby, or even if you work somewhere part-time, it's kind of getting back into those roles and what you view as those expectations for you and your, your character in those roles. Yes. Oh, those roles are so pivotal they are just they can be guideposts for us when we're grieving they can also like anna was saying hinder our grief they can impact our grief oh definitely yeah and i think um you know as much as the the movie really does kind of become about billy um in the sense of like, oh, whoa, okay. Um, <laughs> you know, when we, we meet the ending and, and see what happens, it's also very much about teenage relationships and expectations. And also, even though our bodies are fully grown, our minds still are not, our experience levels in life still are not. And really anyone who's out there who is an elder sibling or a parent or grandparent or even mentor or peer worker, that's something that we have to approach with sensitivity as well. The adolescent mind is very different than the adult mind. I mean, I would venture to say the young adult mind and the middle-aged adult mind is very different than the more experienced adult mind as well. And sometimes it's easy to forget to be sensitive to those sorts of things. You know, you look like an adult, you're almost old enough to legally be an adult, then you just have to behave in this way. And these are the expectations set forth in our culture or in our family or society for grownups. Um, And it's very difficult to remember, you know, this person is younger than me. They're not as experienced as me. They haven't lived the same life I have. Um, and I, I need to be sensitive to that. And also, when you have adults in a lot of these situations related to loss and grief and change, they're going through their own journey. And um, sometimes that can kind of impact how they interact with the adolescents and um, also maybe not be the best role model placement for the adolescents in terms of behavior models. Yes. Yes. I second all of that as, right, as adolescents, we're really trying to discover who we are. And so our personality is changing. We're trying on all these different personalities while we're also trying to navigate the world. Grief complicates that as also the adults in our world may no longer be able to help us navigate these new spaces because they are also grieving and we see that with billy like anna has said billy does not have any support he's like the bad kid in town he's getting arrested everybody's like oh yeah it's billy so he right there nobody's advocating for him except for sydney and even she's like hmm it could be my boyfriend i think it might be my boyfriend (laughs) yeah when i tell you my boyfriend's killer I really mean it, you know, (laughs) Um, (laughs) but yeah, it it is sad. And and then I wonder too about Billy, like, has anyone ever advocated for him? And maybe he grew up in an entire um, environment of dysfunction. We don't know. 
if this was like a one-off thing with, with his dad or, you know, if it's just adding to the Jenga pile of mm-hmm. things that have happened in his parents' relationship. Yes, and we don't know his relationship with his mom. We can guess that it was the most significant relationship. Mm-hmm. We could guess that maybe it wasn't the healthiest because of his yep. response, that he is going to destroy everyone and when we are grieving we do there is this anger there is this we don't want other people to be happy we don't want other people to have any kind of feelings because ours are so intense yeah most of us don't grieve and decide that we need to go kill everybody who well one we're targeting our girlfriend and he is very methodical to go ahead and be like you know what i'm just throwing some extra killings that way nobody knows i was really wanting to kill my girlfriend so I can get away with it oh totally yeah and it's just kind of it's very planned out I mean it's completely orchestrated and um he really put a a, I don't want to say put a lot of thought into it because that sounds complimentary but there was definitely he did (laughs) yeah it was maniacal it was thoughtful like he he really master, masterminded to the point he got his best friend to go oh. murder with him. Yeah. Poor Stu. And, you know, he's just like, oh, it was peer pressure. But that's another huge thing during adolescence. I mean, you know, I feel terrible admitting this. Any of my friends from high school, you know, this is true. But uh, instead of succumbing to peer pressure, I would wrap my friends out. <laughs> because. I had a very adamant stance on a lot of um, activities that most teenagers do engage in. And the fact that I was not doing that made me feel as though my friends should not be doing that either. Um, so I, I, it was with good intentions. I just didn't want anyone to get hurt or damage themselves or their bodies. But uh, yeah, I was... I was that friend but on the other hand (laughs) um you know the peer pressure associated with I can especially in in college in the early years for me which you're still sort of an adolescent 17 18 19 um to look a certain way and behave a certain way and um you know that that was definitely something that I succumbed to I mean I was going tanning I went blonde I was working out like a mad person to achieve this image that I didn't even want uh, but everyone Mm -hmm. seemed to think was great so you know we all experience peer pressure and it is something throughout all of our lifetimes I think that as you mature in your adulthood it's easier to just kind of say well I'll be to my own drum the heck with what everyone else thinks Um, what about you Margaret what's your take on peer pressure Oh, yes, it it can be brutal, like our drive to just fit in, to be part of a group. We will compromise ourselves. We will sell ourselves to be part of the group. Or like you were touching on, like for you, like your values became like so important that you were like, I can't be part of the group because I need to protect my friends. I need to take care of them. And as we're learning, like adolescence is that time when we are learning who we are and how do we weather peer pressure? Because mm-hmm. like Anna was saying, it is throughout our lifetimes. It changes. It doesn't feel as intense when we're adolescents. And there still is peer pressure, workplace pressure. And then how are we dealing mm-hmm. with and responding to these? Yeah. And even like you said, workplace pressure. I mean, that's a huge thing, too. Um, there's a lot of peer pressure in the workplace and how many of us have worked in an environment where, you know, there's a lot of water cooler gossip and backbiting and kind of leapfrogging over people. And, and it's just part of the culture. Like it's normal. Like, oh yeah, it's fine to send like super aggressive email to someone or to speak in a manner that is not pleasing to others. And it's just accepted. Um, and then you walk into another job or even 
you know, to visit a friend at their workplace or whatever the case is, and they have a very positive environment and you're kind of hit with a ton of bricks, like, wait a minute here, why can't every working environment be like that? It's also just kind of the pressure to achieve whatever your goals are, wherever you work, kind of comes down to what will I do? What will I sacrifice to achieve these goals and to succumb to the pressure? Or will I make changes and not succumb to the pressure? And I think that's a very valid point about peer pressure that impacts adults because think about it, right? <clears throat> Most of us go to college, you go right out of high school, <clears throat> you're what, 22 when you graduate, 21, 23, somewhere in there. Um, you know, I, I worked through college, so it was a little bit of a longer process for me. But with that, you're working, you're in the real world, right? Let's just say most people start working full time, 20 years old, right? That's a good age. We'll pick that. <sighs> you retire if you're lucky in your late 60s or early 70s. So you're working basically for 50 years and experiencing all these different sorts of peer pressures and different sorts of goal-related pressure and project pressure. That's a lot to deal with. Yes, well said. And as you're talking about pressure, I was thinking of Gail Weathers, like her character is all about the pressure to get the story, to be the first on it, to write the book, to have all of these things, and then how that impacts mm -hmm. everybody, including Billy and Sydney. Gail's drive the pressure for her to be the best, to stand mm -hmm. out the most. Yeah. Yeah, it really does. And I know oftentimes. I find that trying to be the best at all costs has the potential to bring out the worst in people. Yes, definitely. Yeah. So <clears throat> instead of trying to be the best at your job or what you're doing, how about just be the best version of you? That is, that's my advice. Everyone be the best yes. version of you. Because if Billy would have tried to be the best Billy he could be, who knows what he could have accomplished and done in his fictional life. Um, but you know, it's, it's just, he could have done some really great things. Yes, maybe. I kind of wonder if he was just one of those tragic people that he got so turned around, he was going to be the best at being a killer. Yeah, maybe. He became the villain. Mm -hmm. Which is sad. Like, it's just, you know, I, it's unfortunate. Not that I really feel too bad for him since he is our antagonist, but just yes. from a broader perspective. <laughs> this one was a hard one for me, though, because we always ask each other if we relate to someone in the film. Mm -hmm. um, I think I'll ask you first. <laughs> Who do you most relate oh. to in the movie? <laughs> yes. Oh, my gosh. Who do I most relate to? <sighs> I'm going to have to either go with Randy, who just has all these facts about everything. Yeah. Or do is it Dewey, her brother? Oh, the yeah. Officer? Yeah, he's like trying his best and people aren't taking him seriously. And he really just wants to help, but he just kind of fumbles through helping. Mm -hmm. So I feel like one of those two. How about yourself? Um, I... I actually, I, I forget the character's name, but the um, the tech guy for Gail Weathers, I think <laughs> I relate to him because, like, I'm always trying to do my job, but, like, stay commonsensical and chill about it, like, whatever I'm focusing on. And I always also have lots of snacks. Um, so <laughs> that's why I relate to him, just because I'm like, yeah, I totally do that all the time. I'm sitting at, like, my laptop or my monitor doing something and I'm eating Tostitos. Like, um, also, for what it's worth, I feel like he kind of almost seemed to be the voice of reason. We don't hear from him too much or see him doing too much, but it always seems like he has more common sense than everyone else in the film mm -hmm. when, when we do see him interacting. Yes. Ooh, so if you're listening, please, you can answer along too. Leave a comment. Who do you most relate to in Scream? Definitely. Um, so we hope you enjoyed 
in this little trip into Loomis land um, and hope that you learn something. The next time you hear the phrase, you want to play a game, maybe you'll think about this podcast a little bit too. Yeah. And um, we look forward to introducing you to some more characters and their family members and friends and victims on our next podcast. Until then, make sure you close that coffin lid before you take your nap. And we'll see you on the next one. See you on the next one. Thank you for listening. Happy haunting.